City. He's not here. I recognize him. He's in New York. Because I'm here, she'll send a smile. Yeah, this was a new Bond said that he got her somewhere that she made her run and leave. Lost her car, couldn't find us, whatever it was. <laughs> yeah. See Carol from Federal Heights? Yeah. Front row, yeah, I far right hand side. Try to beat the traffic as much as I can. She's got her hair down. She looks so much different. I didn't, yeah. I'd walk right past her, didn't recognize her. Yeah. <laughs> All right, good evening, everyone. This time I'd like to call the January 16, 2019, Denver Regional Council of Governments meeting to order. At this point, I would ask all of you to rise and please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So before we start the roll call, we have some uh, new members tonight. Jeremy Fig is the new member from Central City. George Marlin, uh, Clear Creek County, is the new alternate. And Casey Ty for Jefferson County is the new alternate. And I'm not sure we have any of them here. So cookies and donuts on them next time. <laughs> this time, Ms. Garcia, would you take the roll, please? Eva Henry? Here. Jeff Baker? Here. Elise Jones, Here. David Beacom, Here. Randy Wheelock, Here. George Marlin, Nicholas Williams, Here. Kevin Flynn, Here. Roger Partridge, Here. Ron Engels, <clears throat> Libby Zabo, Casey Ty, Bob Pfeiffer, Here. Bob Roth, Allison Hiltz, Larry Vidham, David Spellman, Aaron Brockett, Here. Margo Ramsden, Lynn Baca, Roger Hudson, Ben Price, George Teal, Jason Gray, here. Tammy Maurer, here. Jeremy Fay, Richard Champion, Gail Christie, Rick Teeter, here. Debbie Nasta, Catherine Whitman, Luke Conklin, Linda Olson, Cheryl Wink, Bill Gipp, Daniel Dick, Peter Peterson, Bobby Sindelar, Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey, here. Scott Norquist, Storm Glore, Jim Dale, here. John Rakowski, George Lance, Mike Hillman, Stephanie Walton, Christine Berg, Dana Gutwein, Jacob LeBure, Jerry Bean, Isaac Levy, Brina Elrod, Kyle Schlachter, Larry Strock, Present. Uh, Present. John Peck, Ashley Stolzman, Connie Sullivan, here. Joyce Palazuski, Paul Sutton, here. Chris Larson, Julie Mullica, here. John Dyack, Josh Rivero, here. Sally Daigle, Roberta Mooney, Andy Hammerly, here. Jessica Sand, Herb Atchison, here. Bud Starker, here. Adam Zarin, here. Deborah Perkins Smith, Phil Van Meter.
First item on the agenda would be to move to approve the agenda. If we have, we have a motion from the board, I have a so moved and second. second. All in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, we will move forward. Before we start into our reports of the chairs, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce one of the new leaders of Colorado, a very nice young lady that uh, I've had a chance to meet with several times now, and she hates anything technology. Just can't stand the stuff. <laughs> So let me please introduce Alice. Would you come forward? Alice Jackson, the new president of XL Energy for Colorado. Please welcome her. Call <clears throat> Chuck again. Good evening, everyone. So, there's a trip hazard here. I'm going to go around. <laughs> OK, now I'm just going to stand here on one foot. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for having me out here this evening. Um, I have had a couple of conversations with Mayor Atchison, and I appreciate the opportunity to become able to come out and say hello. Uh, a number of you probably also saw me over at the Metro Denver Chamber. Um, there was a, a meeting there that a number of you I know were participating in. And I had like two minutes, and so Herb is up that a little bit. Uh, <laughs> he's giving me about five to ten minutes to speak with you just a little bit. So just really quickly, want to give you a little bit of my background. I have been a Colorado resident for five years, um, but I, I haven't, and I've worked for David Eves. So many of you know David Eves. One of the first questions that I get is, what happened to David Eves? Nothing has happened to David Eves. He is phenomenal. He still works for the company. He's wonderful. He has simply promoted. And um, if you look at our organization, we do serve eight states across our country. And in those eight states, we, as we have a holding company that has four operating companies that are four different utilities. David now has the pleasure of being the president of the presidents, uh, because in each of those operating companies, we have a president. And he now has to wrangle all four of us. So he now has eight states. He has to figure out all the politics and everything associated with them and keep that moving forward. So he does still reside in Colorado. But unfortunately for him, he's commuting an awful lot up to Minnesota. Um, at which the weather here is so much better. He loves coming home and seeing that sunshine versus the cloudy days up there. So when you see him, give him a hard time. Um, but he says hello to everyone, and he's doing really well. Um, a little bit about my background and where I've come from. I am actually have spent less time in a utility than I have um, outside of the utility industry. Um, I've been with Excel Energy just shy of eight years now. I started with them in Amarillo, Texas, um, and ran the Texas and New Mexico regulatory activities before moving to Colorado and taking those on. But really, at the end of the day, and the reason uh, Mayor likes to tease me about it is, is my background's IT. Um, I am a geek at heart. I like to get into the details. And quite frankly, my employees often tell me, take it to a higher level. And I do look for those glazed eyes in the audiences when I'm talking to people, because I'll talk numbers until the end of the day. Um, but a lot of people don't like following along that way. So I'll do my best to stay out of those with uh, you all. But please feel free. If we're ever in one-on-one -on -one conversations, you're like, take it to a higher level, just let me know. I'm happy to do so. But I do like miring myself in some of those details and those, that data in the weeds. Um, I come here with a family. I have four sons at home. In fact, one of them turns five-year-old today. Uh, he is my only Colorado native. Um, and in fact, speaking of David Ease, he's the one who drove me to the hospital. So <laughs> and that was five years ago yesterday. Uh, so great stories that I can share, but it just talks about the character of the gentleman I was just talking about. Um, but yes, after this, I'm, I'm turning down the cookies you all have because we have cake and we have ice cream at home that I'm looking forward to getting to with our five-year-old uh, who's just bouncing off the walls in order to have a lot of fun. Um, but you know, a number of you have probably seen some of the things that our company is doing. And quite frankly, I am really excited about the time we are in and the changes that we are able to affect and what we're able to do and stand up and be, particularly here in Colorado. Uh, you know, I said I've spent less time in the utility industry. I don't know about you. I am not one who went to high school and went to college going, utilities, that's where I'm going. There really aren't very many people that have. But what I have come to find out, and it wasn't something that I instantaneously got to, is I really do hope that I get to retire from a utility. Uh, whether it's Excel Energy or another one that I have the pleasure to serve, it is an industry that I see as foundational to our society, foundational to our economy. And quite frankly, there is not another business I could be in that touches more people's lives on a day-to-day -day basis. So if I do a really good job of doing my job, not only do those that invest in my business benefit, but every single citizen of our state 
that I have the pleasure of serving gets to benefit as well. And that comes back to some of the announcements we made. In early December last year, you may have seen in some of the papers or you may have heard from me or my team directly, is that we announced a very ambitious target. And that is, is an 80% carbon reduction from our 2005 levels by 2030 and a 0% carbon future by 2050. Now, big pieces of the puzzle of that. There are guardrails that go along with that. Number one, if the lights are not on and if the gas is not in the pipe, we're not doing our job. So reliability has to be there. Right now, we operate in Colorado on the uh, PSCO system at 99.95% um, reliability. We kind of like that number. Um, we want to make sure that we stay close to it, if not improve it over time, and make sure that we have that great reliability for all of our businesses and customers. But we have to make sure that the way we move forward in any of the transition we're talking about maintains those numbers. The second piece of the puzzle is affordability. I hate the fact that we would have to be the one that's deciding, the deciding factor on somebody's table if they're looking between buying food, sending their kid to school, buying a piece of clothing, or paying their electricity bill or their natural gas bill. That is not my goal. And so right now, we're very fortunate that in Colorado, our residential rates are 29% below the national average. I like that number too. Don't want that to change a whole lot. So that's the other boundary that we look at and the other lens we'll be looking at as we move forward and we process, whether it's legislation over at the, at the state legislature, it's decision making at the regulatory agencies that we <coughs> apply to and we are regulated by, or it's working with all of our communities such as you and figuring out what makes sense Three lenses. Number one, is it making us move forward and closer to the 0% carbon? Number two, is it going to maintain reliability? Is it going to increase, decrease, or maintain the rates that we have? And the same thing on reliability. So those three factors are the three lenses we're going to be going through and looking at as we move through all of the different transitions and things we're looking at. What I can tell you is for the last two years, I stepped out of doing my regulatory job for Colorado. And I stepped into a technology role for all eight states. Um, I got to geek out for a little bit, and it was a whole lot of fun. I got to spend two years. First off, I started a new national economic development organization inside of Excel Energy. That is the one that's doing the certified sites that many of you are familiar with, the certified buildings, building and establishing relationships across the country with site selectors and guild members in order to be able to attract them on an energy basis to our service territories, whether it's in Colorado or other states. The second thing that I got to do was dig into technology. What are the new ones that are out there? What are the ones that are too expensive for us to buy into today? What are the possibilities of the existing systems that we have to modify to really drive towards those goals that I was mentioning before? So it was a real pleasure to be able to do that for the company. And then they asked me to step into this role. And I'm very happy to be here. I still get to geek out a little bit as part of the deal uh, and dig into some of my, my technological side. But it really is quite a pleasure to be able to serve the citizens of Colorado in the role that I have, working with all of you, understanding the different perspectives that come to the table, and figuring out how can we be a better service provider when it comes to electricity and natural gas in the state of Colorado. So thank you for having me here tonight. Herb, I don't know if you wanted me to take any questions tonight, or if we get to that maybe another time if you want me to come back. But. Thank you very much for your time. Enjoy your evening. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. First up is the Regional Transportation Committee we met yesterday. Uh, the big one on this is I know there was a lot of discussion on the TIP uh, process the last time. The board here did modify the TIP award program that went back to RTC yesterday that was approved on the recommendation that came from this board, uh, which changed the waiting list basically, but the eight projects were approved. And we also had a uh, confirmation from the city and county of Denver that they would not uh, ask for any relief on that. So we were good to go with that. Other than that, a lot of the same things we are uh, talking about at RTC is very much what you and your communities are talking about. What's the next step for transportation? Uh, there's a lot of discussions, uh, and I'll talk about from Metro Mayor's point a little bit later in the agenda, but uh, this subject hasn't gone away. Uh, MTDs, R M RTAs, EEBs, I think is the new acronym for the latest one that came out. But from Dr. Cog, uh, the Metro Mayors have come together along with the counties to start to have that conversation in the metro areas, what is our next option and how can we move forward? 
The likelihood of a statewide ballot in 2019 continues to diminish because no one can figure out what to put on the ballot. And anything going through in 2019 needs a major campaign of information to the public. And there is neither the funding nor the time that we think is necessary for that. So we think this is still going to be at the earliest, probably a 2020. But you will continue to get updates uh, through the counties, through the mayors, and here as anything starts to progress on. But right now, I think it's part of more of a conversation and then also to see where the priorities that are listed by the governor are going to come out. His first priority out, out of the jump has been uh, free kindergarten education. And even though there was a group that met December 17th at the request of the outgoing and the current governor, that uh, follow-up meeting has not been scheduled. There's a group of about 65 people from across the metro area, including counties, businesses, and stuff. So that will uh, follow up. Some of you may recognize the name Carrie Kennedy, uh, who has been around. She's worked for Denver. She's worked here in the state. She has been uh, selected by the governor as a policy person for her, him working on the issues of education and transportation. So we expect to hear a lot from Kerry over the next few months and try to make sure that what we're doing is we're getting representation across the metro area and the state if at all possible. But the likelihood of another statewide ballot uh, is going to be tough to sell. It, it, there was a lot of money spent on that initiative that uh, turned out to be soundly defeated both in uh, Prop 110 and 109. That's about the extent of where the Transportation uh, Committee went yesterday, and you'll see some of the actions that they did approve later on in the agenda tonight. On performance and engagement, uh, Mr. Beacom, I think you're up. No meeting. That's an easy one to do. Oh. Very well. Ms. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Stoltzman, Finance and Budget. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Finance and Budget Committee met this evening. Um, we have authorized the Executive Director to execute a contract for van pool services. So we are going to get to continue to provide those for folks in the region. And the other thing that we did was uh, authorize the Executive Director to negotiate and execute a contract that enables the staff to work on some software that will facilitate the people who provide trips to be able to provide them even if they cross boundaries and things like that. So both things really critical to the region, and we're happy to approve them. Okay. Mr. Pfeiffer, no speeches tonight, but would you come <laughs> would you come join us up front for a minute? Unfortunately, Bob Roth is not here tonight. And so I know this is just gonna gall him when we tell him that we gave out <laughs> another service award <clears throat> and it's not a clock. <laughs> so as, as we've talked about before, we have started a new process uh, made out of recycled wood for those who have service awards coming in both from the employee base and from the board of directors. So tonight we're recognizing Mr. Bob Roth, Five, Junior. Five, five. Junior. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Only because he's not near as big as Bob Roth. But uh, Bob Pfeiffer has now completed five years of service here at Dr. Cog, and we want to congratulate him on his five years of service. Ah, So five years now, you don't get a clock, you get a piece of wood. That's what it's been described to me. <laughs> so the executive director just couldn't wait till his turn, so he's already started. All right. Mr. Rex, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, one programmatic note, um, we will be having a, a February work session, which is on February 6th. Um, and the topic is, uh, it's all going to be related to transportation. Um, as, the, as the chairman mentioned, there has been a lot of discussion amongst ourselves and um, um, Metro Mayor's staff, as well as their executive team. Uh, you know, what happens now with the failure of 110 and 109? What's the options, right? Should we begin to explore some regional and uh, collaborative opportunities um, to look at um, some funding opportunities? So we're going to have an open discussion about that. We'll probably even get a readout from the Metro Mayor's Caucus retreat that was this past Saturday. Um, so stay tuned on that. The other, op the other um, agenda item for the, the, uh, the work session 
will be uh, the Mobility Choice Blueprint. You know, we've mentioned that several times and have several presentations throughout the way with Mobility Choice. Um, that report is wrapping up as we speak, and uh, we, we want to present that to you at that work session and have a uh, discussion about next steps. So, uh, so stay tuned for that. Uh, Sub-regional call for projects. I'm so sure you all are, are aware of this. The, the, uh, the uh, sub-regional call for projects open on January 2nd. Um, your staff, I'm sure, are busily uh, putting together applications to submit to your sub-regional forum no later than February 27th. Very important date. Mark it on your calendars. So each sub-region will review those, those applications, and then a representative of the sub-regional forum will present those recommendations back to the full board um, at a later date. We're kind of, we're looking in uh, probably the April time frame for, for that to occur. Uh, award celebration, uh, again, that's, that it's on April 10th is when that, that's, that's going to occur. It's in the same location as last year. Uh, and this is kind of the last chance to nominate projects, programs, and plans that, uh, um, uh, you know, for the MetroVision Awards and the other awards. So please give some thought, talk to your staff about, uh, about uh, yeah, submittals and all that kind of good stuff. Um, and also the JVC, or the John V. Christensen Award, which is kind of our more, most pre prestigious award. Um, if you have any recommendations uh, for that award, please submit those to us. And even if you don't want to necessarily write the recommendation for that, for that person, please just share us a name and we'll chase down someone to recommend them. So just please, if, you're, if you know of anybody that you think is worthy of that award that has done work on a regional scale throughout his or her lifetime, um, we'd be, we'd be um, happy, to, uh, happy to hear that, who that might be. Uh, Winter Bike to Work Day. And uh, it's, it's coming up. What's the date, Steve? Is it February? February 8th. February 8th. And we have some additional flyers in that and posters. If you, if you guys are interested, please grab a few more to share with friends, family, and coworkers. Um, we're, we're hoping to get out, what, 3,000, 4,000 riders this year, Steve? 4,000. That a boy. Here we go. I mentioned this last time. City, um, city, we have a, um, we're beginning a city county manager forum. Um, and so we have a flyer for, for, for you to share this with your city or county manager. Please do so. We got tremendous um, uh, interest in this so far, but we want to make sure we get a great turnout. So please, please um, share that with your city manager. It's really an opportunity for us to um, um, you know, form a, a stronger bond with, with your most senior staff. Also, uh, we also want to make sure that they are aware of the upcoming agenda items that we have. Um, that, that you guys will be taking action on so that they can, uh, if nothing else, can be, can be briefed on, on what's coming up. But we hope they'll help us in shaping those agendas too going forth. So there's a lot of opportunity there. And we're very excited about it. So please. Oh, the one thing I will note, um, the February 21st, it was originally 20, February 14th, but that date was changed to 20, uh, February 24th first because there was a CML um, event that there, it was in conflict with. So. Uh, let me see. Uh, Planometrics kickoff. Um, almost a year of planning, and we're ready to kick off the 2018 regional planometric product uh, project. Um, we've we've uh, successfully facilitated the two prior planometric products, and we capture a lot of data data features such as building footprints, edge of pavements, parking lots, trails uh, for nearly 1,200 square miles of, within this region. So. Um, and that would not be possible. Um, these data sets are very useful to you and your communities, and quite frankly, would not be possible without the uh, participation of your communities. And we get a cut rate because of it, so that, that's, that's uh, always a good, good thing. The last thing I wanted to mention, in a good note, on this day in 1989, uh, that's 10,957 days ago, Jayla Sanchez was hired by Dr. Cog as an ombudsman. Aww. Jayla here, where is she? There she is. So, oh, it looks like she wants to speak. I should have known. But before she does that, I, you know, I tried to find, you know, what, what's, what events happened on that day, right, back in uh, February 16th of 1989. I couldn't find any. The only thing I could find, Days of Our Lives won the Soap Opera Digest for you. That was it. Um, and I'm sure on her commute, um, she, she was jamming to uh, Millie Vanilli's Girl, You Know It's True on her Walkman. 
So I would just want to congratulate Jill. I think she will watch your um, words. Well, yeah, I, I, 30 years, right? So maybe I, I, I just want to say thanks to the board and all the previous board members because I've had a lot of opportunities at Dr. Cog, um, a lot of opportunities to grow and learn and even to make some mistakes. And uh, uh, there's not a better place to work, in, in my opinion. Uh, and that's largely because of you guys. And I've been here a long time, and I've seen... Uh, good boards and boards that weren't as uh, as amenable as you all are as as right, effective Jill, as you enough. all are. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing good though. I uh, uh, congratulations to you all because it's a it's a a different cog than it was when I started. A better cog. Thank you, Jayla, very much. And I, I I'm sure I speak for everybody here. The, you know, thank you and congratulations on all the tremendous work that you've done through your last 30 years and making life better for seniors in this region. You're, you're a true one of Dr. Cog's angels. That's it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <laughs> well, we had a little pressure put on the, uh, our next guest. I'm going to introduce in just a minute. Uh, she came to the very first meeting yesterday morning, and we said, well, you found it <coughs> once. How about coming back tomorrow night? So we've been very lucky. Uh, I want to take a moment to introduce one of our new uh, members of the governor's staff and one that we are all very interested in as the new director of CDOT, Shoshana Liu. Shoshana, you want to come and join us up front? And right up here, we're going to put a mic on you. And yeah, everything turns into an impression. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, join me, please, in welcoming Shoshana to the city of Canada. Thank you for having me uh, tw twice in one week. I think I've seen some of you three times in one week, which is a lot considering I've been here only a day longer than one week. Um, you know, it's really a pleasure to get a chance to sort of meet all of you face to face this early in being here because I think the, it kind of signifies the ability to have a real partnership in the work that we all do. And, you know, just to tell you a little bit about myself and what I bring to this conversation and what I'm hoping to sort of have in a dialogue with all of you, you know. Um, I, I do not have the answers to all the questions yet because I've been here about a week and I think anyone who moves to a new place and claims that they you know, know exactly what they're driving at before they have an opportunity to listen to people hasn't listened hard enough. Um, but you know, I, I most recently uh, came from the Rhode Island Department of Transportation where I was the uh, Chief Operating Officer overseeing the capital program there and prior to that I was the CFO at the U.S. Department of Transportation um, in the previous administration. And, sort of oversaw the transportation budget for all, all of the modes that flow through the Federal Transportation Department. So sort of thinking about how we prioritize resources in this space is something I'm deeply passionate about and you know, very cognizant of how sort of personally it impacts every one of you, your constituents, and all of our lives. You know, I think that is something that really aligns with what we've heard from the governor and his vision so far and in the state of the state last week, you know, really talking about opportunity and access for all and sort of the need to kind of level the playing field in terms of the kind of ways that we have access to resources in our lives. And if you think about the work that we all do, that's what it's about, right? It's about connecting people to various places. Transportation is not for the asphalt that we you know, put in the ground, but it's a means to an end. And you know, I think the previous slide, <laughs> the, um, you know, seeing the goals of this organization just you know, really aligns with, I think, the priorities that we all sort of intuitively feel when we think about how we use transportation, why we use transportation. and what it means to all of us. So, you know, I think I, I wanted to kind of kick off this conversation with all of you now because I'm hoping to you know, really get to know as many of you as possible um, you know, for more than five minutes at the top of a meeting to really hear about what the you know, folks in your community need from our transportation system. And, you know, there are always trade-offs there. You know, I, I can hazard a guess that I will probably not make all of you happy all the time, as is never the case in this field. But, you know, Knowing what we're dealing with in terms of impact and sort of the ways that people's lives are affected by transportation, and frankly, the things that are you know exciting to people and frustrating to people, you know, I think is really um, invaluable in terms of making better decisions about how we serve as stewards of the resources that um, the taxpayers put into the system. And you know, I, I I sometimes joke that you know I like to hear people's pothole complaints. You probably also all have the experience where like you go to a dinner and you know you get everybody goes around in a circle and you hear about whose stop sign is down that week. You know, I, I actually find that to be valuable feedback because often, you know, your your neighbor's comment is meaningful because you know they, they may not be able to tell you the you know roughness index of the concrete, but they sort of know what it's doing for them. So I think 
you know, having a sort of open conversation about, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly of the transportation system, and you know how we're sort of dealing with the individual effects it has on people, um, is really what this is all about. And you know, I'm hoping that, you know, the working together with this group, we can engage deeply in that conversation. You know, I think one other issue that I would just touch on quickly, knowing it's a priority for all of you, um, a priority for the governor, and something you'll be hearing more about, um, you know, in the coming days, weeks, and months, is sort of the environmental impact of the way that we use the transportation system. Um, sort of thinking about you know, not just electrification and the, you know, making the mobile sources themselves more efficient, but also thinking about how that overlays with the choices and the mobility options that we have. And you know, knowing that the sort of pressures that we put on our system and the assets that we use to put those pressures on the system have to kind of go hand in hand in terms of how we think about movement and you know, the way that we use transportation in a more sustainable way. You know, it's uh, exciting to be in a city in a metro that's growing, but with that come all of the pressures that come with it. You know, physical and uh, metaphysical, right? And sort of knowing, knowing that we can't build our way out of the fact that you know, population growth that, you know, usually leads to some VMT growth if we don't sort of manage against it and think sort of critically and strategically you know, about different ways to move and use the transportation system. So you know, I know that this group is at the forefront of that conversation already. You know, I'm excited to be moving to a place where that conversation is one that people welcome and have been you know, having, I think, in a very forward-looking way. You know, I'll just say that the presentation yesterday was outstanding in terms of using data to kind of talk about those challenges. And having seen a lot of PowerPoints in that respect, it was one of the better ones I've seen in a long time. So you know, I think it's just indicative that there is a serious consideration of the issues, but also of the analytics that help us understand how we make decisions about those issues. And you know, I think that is something that I know is going to be a significant priority for the governor and this administration. And I suspect that this group will uh, you know, be the place where a lot of that policy comes together. So um, with that, if there's anything I can tell you, and you want to do questions or however you want to handle it. We will we'll leave it. Perfect. When you have a smaller audience. <laughs> that sounds better. <laughs> so Shauna, thanks for coming. And again, what I want you to take notice of is that between XL Energy and the governor, they're hiring very young people who have a lot of stamina and a lot of will and a lot of opportunity to stand here and carry very big loads on their shoulders because they're a lot younger than I am. So we want to, uh, again, thank Shoshana and Alice both for coming tonight and introducing you. These are, these are new leaders in our state, and we expect a lot of them, and they expect a lot of us in back in making partnerships move forward in both groups. So Shoshana, thanks again for working us back in tonight. I know you had a very busy schedule the last couple of days. So again, uh, yeah, <laughs> she's getting to know where she's at. The one uh, thing that we had was just come where you came this morning, and you can come back to the same place. So it works out very good. So again, Shoshana, thank you. And Alice, I know, went home to her five-year-old's birthday party. So again, uh, thanks, Alice. So at this point, we'll move on to our item and agenda. And thank you all for giving us a few minutes to welcome new leaders here in the state. Next item up is public comments. This is a period of up to 45 minutes allocated now for public comment, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests for the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. I cha uh, the chair requests that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Do we have anyone in the public who'd like to come forward at this time? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to our next item, the community spotlight. Uh, tonight's spotlight is on the city of Wheat Ridge, but uh, while uh, Bud is getting ready, let me announce the winners of the next one. Now, we've done something a little bit different. If you think about, there are 58 represented bodies here on the board, and if we take one a month, it'll take us five years to get through them. <laughs> so, <clears throat> starting with the next meeting, out of the draw of the hat, and I think neither one of the two are here tonight, but they'll, that's what you get for not showing up. <laughs> okay. Castle Rock is here, that's right. Castle Rock is here tonight. You are next up, and uh, your normal representative is very versed in getting up and talking to people, so we, we know that George will do a great job. Oh, uh, sure he will. Okay. So Castle Rock and the town of Parker are our next two, so we will see the two of them in one month. Mr. Starker, City of Wheat Ridge, please. Thank you very much. Oh, we've got to get to somewhere else. We've got a slideshow, right?
Well, that looks like a good presentation. Thank you. I'm Bud Starker. I'm the mayor of Wheat Ridge, and I'm uh, happy to be here and uh, tell you a little bit about our city. Terrific. So I've, uh, I moved to Wheat Ridge in uh, 1975, the house that I lived in. Uh, I own a restaurant there, and I have uh, been uh, mayor for just, about, just a little over a year. Um, Wheat Ridge was uh, settled in the, 18, in the 1850s with the gold rush. It, uh, instead, of, instead of the uh, residents going out to, to mine gold, they decided to uh, stay home and, and supply the uh, mining community with agricultural products. And uh, we continued on in that history, uh, supplying the uh, truck farms and uh, orchards for uh, the mining industry and the later urban urban area that we were they were going through. We uh, migrated to Carnations in the uh, 50s and 60s. We were one time Carnation capital of the world and sent flowers to the White House on a weekly basis. We uh, became a home rule city in 1969. We're celebrating 50 years as a home rule city that was driven by uh, annexation. Uh, desires from the city of Denver and uh, about a week before Jefferson City, currently the city of Lakewood, went, uh, went, went to a vote. We decided to, uh, we got a vote in ahead of, a week ahead of time and, uh, and formulated the city of Wheat Ridge. So that was, um, that was a pretty outstanding uh, accomplishment for the farmers in Wheat Ridge. We're the home of the farmers. Um, okay, we have a... Uh, City manager, a mayor form of government. Uh, we have four council districts, two council members each with four-year staggered terms. And uh, fortunately, the mayor only votes in the case of a tie, which is certainly fine with me. We, um, let me get, get the slides here right. We have a uh, uh, um, staff that we, um, we're not a full-service city. We provide police, parks, and, and public works. Uh, a couple of years ago, we merged with the uh, West Metro Fire Department, and the Arvada uh, Fire helps us out on the north side. I-70 bisects our city, so we have uh, have interstate uh, commerce that comes and, and all of the attendant uh, issues with that. We have uh, local, local water and sewer districts that uh, serve our citizens. We have... Um, Frozen? Okay. Okay. So I'm going I'm to keep going. Wheat Ridge um, is located uh, uh, north of Lakewood, um, south of Arvada, west of Denver, and east of Golden. Has about uh, 31,000 residents. We're an older community than most, with more 50 percent of our residents are age 45 to 85. Um, we have. Uh, uh, urban, uh, we're, we're, we say we're close to the mountains and uh, close to downtown, so it's a really easy place to, uh, to get around to. We've got a, a full-service police department with uh, 82 sworn officers, 24 non-sworn officers. We do a lot of um, uh, sharing uh, police and public safety uh, uh, operations with our uh, county and uh, joining, joining communities, and that's been a, a growing and a very successful um, program for us. Okay, let's see, where are we now? The graphics, okay, we talked about our police guys. We've got a, we've got a great educational uh, system in Wheat Ridge. Wheat Ridge High School uh, does uh, a lot of uh, good academics and good uh, development and workforce education, and uh, particularly in the areas of uh, hospitality, uh, health care, and construction. We, um, uh, I've got a full range of uh, educational opportunities for our kids uh, going down through uh, elementary school and uh, middle school. Okay. We've got, uh, in serving our senior, our senior engagement programs, we've got an active adult center. We've got a great recreational center that focuses a lot on senior, uh, senior recreation activities. Uh, seniors Resource Center is located in our community and, and provides great uh, services to our seniors. 
Uh, we've got a, issues that address the homeless. Um, resource. Okay, here we are. Family Tree, Jefferson Center for Mental Health, providing with, uh, withdrawal services for us, a severe weather network partnership with our um, faith community, uh, heading home, and Metropolitan Community Provider Network, built a new, a new facility on our community that uh, helps our, helps our uh, low-income uh, residents and, uh, and even people throughout the county to get uh, medical services. Um, we've got uh, transportation uh, challenges in our community, as most of us do. We've got uh, uh, I-70 coming through. We're looking at the I-70 Kipling interchange to see what we can do with that. We've got Wadsworth uh, Boulevard widening improvements that we're, we're providing some funding for and, uh, and working with uh, Dr. Kog and other resources to uh, improve that uh, interchange. We've got, a, we've got a good bicycle program at Wheat Ridge. We've got uh, a master bike, a bike ped plan. That uh, and and we're looking. We've got uh, uh, crossing I-70 is a challenge, but we're we're working on those. On um, we inaugurated that my predecessor inaugurated a, sustain a sustainability committee that we're calling now Sustainable Wheat Ridge to focus on six areas of uh, sustainability: green buildings and energy efficiency, renewable energy, transportation, solid waste recycling, water and community engagement. We're working with Excel Energy to provide. Um, uh, auditing services for our community. We engaged and uh, we started uh, an update of our neighborhood revitalization strategy that came out initially in 2005 and we're, we're out surveying neighbors attitudes to see what we can do about uh, how we want to how we want to structure our community and our our uh, neighborhoods in the next 30 or 40 years. Uh, we think that'll um, that'll te lead us into a presentation or into a discussion of uh, you know, per personal rights versus property rights, and how we how we structure our community, how we structure our neighborhoods, addressing issues like uh, uh, ADUs, uh, single night stays, Airbnb and VRBO, and uh, heightened heightened density questions. Um, we um, we've got uh, uh, we invest we uh, had a half a cent sales tax that we put we put forth in the 2016 to do. Um, to do four projects, Anderson Park, some work at Clear Creek Crossing, uh, the corners at Wheat Ridge, and uh, Wadsworth Improvements. Uh, we've got some uh, tra uh, traffic-oriented uh, uh, developments uh, looking at Base Camp. Uh, we've got Clear Creek Crossing. We're doing work at Applewood Shopping Center, and we've got West End 38. We hope to make 38 a uh, main street for our community. Uh, we've been investing for the future as a half a cent sales tax in the, to uh, work on our parks, uh, work on new uh, Highway ramps at Clear Creek Crossing at uh, at I-70, uh, widen Wadsworth Boulevard and in, in improve the uh, traffic safety there. And then we've got Ward Road Station that's coming, and we've got a train that's going to going to join us there someday. Um, <laughs> we've, we've got some good uh, some good residential and employment opportunities that are that are going to go along with that, and and we're really looking forward to that. Uh, Applewood Shopping Center is. Uh, as uh, we lost our wa our Walmart uh, a couple of years ago, but we've got that backfilled with some uh, with some good retailers. We've got also uh, Hacienda Colorado is going to put in a new restaurant for us. Uh, West End 38th, we're really excited. We've got about 150 townhomes and some retail um, retail opportunities on the first floor, and that's going to anchor sort of the west the west end of our um, um, 38th Avenue Main Street. Um, we've uh, got a new a new bank out of that. Uh, Wheat Ridge is a great community. It's close to downtown. It's got great, quiet neighborhoods, and uh, it's looking to the future with uh, uh, pride in our past. So I'd be happy to take any questions, but I'd probably be happier just to sit down. <laughs> <laughs> with that, I thank you for your attention. These presentations get better, so those of you who are up next month, just keep in mind, you've got to keep getting better. <laughs> next item on the agenda is the uh, minutes of the December 19th and the designated location of posting notices. This is item number nine on the consent. At this time, I uh, entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. I have a motion. I have a second. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Seeing none, the motion is carried. 
Moving on to our first item, item number 10. This is a discussion of the amendments of the 2018-2021 Transportation Improvement. Mr. Cottrell, who was supposed to be here yesterday <laughs> and again tonight, unfortunately is serving one of those pleasures that we all look forward to, jury duty. Um. Yeah, well, he's going to be there for a while. It'll, yeah, I think he's at least a week <laughs> or more. <laughs> Mr. Papsdorf, if you would, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to do an adequate job of filling in for Todd tonight. Ron Papsdorf, Director of Transportation Planning and Operations here at Dr. Cog. Um, this item, attachment C in your agenda packet, uh, relates to TIP amendments for the um, 2018 to 2021 TIP, that's the currently adopted TIP, not to be confused with the 2020 to 23 TIP that you all are actively engaged with us in developing now. So periodically uh, we have we receive proposals to amend the existing TIP from uh, agencies throughout the region, uh, usually adjusting an existing project. Uh, those of a certain size and magnitude come forward to the board for approval. Um, we have three for your consideration this evening. Two of them related to CDOT C470 project, uh, which increases funding for the segment that's currently under construction from I-25 to Wadsworth Boulevard. Um, and um, also related to that, moving $14 million from uh, project development work that's going on on C470 west of Wadsworth up to I-70, moving that to increase the funding for the piece that's under construction now and adding $11 million from the Transportation Commission contingency funding uh, to complete that additional $25 million to the uh, funding for that project. The third amendment uh, this evening is for the I-25 improvements, uh, the uh, commonly known as the GAP project uh, from Castle Rock South uh, to Colorado Springs. Our portion in Dr. Cog goes to the El Paso County line. Um, this is increasing the funding in that project by $5 million of Faster Bridge Enterprise funds uh, to address two additional bridges in that section of the project. Um, I think CDOT representatives are here if you have specific questions on those projects. Um, otherwise, we're asking for a motion to adopt the resolution approving the proposed amendments to the 2018-2021 Transportation Improvement Program, uh, the TIP. Uh, for information, the Regional Transportation Committee uh, did act on this uh, yesterday morning and did uh, approve this as well. Are there any questions in regards to the item per you tonight that you have for either CDOT or Dr. Cog staff? If not, the motion it will be proposed tonight is to adopt the resolution approving the proposed amendments to the 2018-2021 Transportation Improvement Program. If there are no questions or comments, if I could have someone move the motion. I have it moved, second. and I have a second. All, all those in favor of the motion as presented, please signify with aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Seeing none, the motion is carried. Mr. Papsdorf, next one, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members of the board, I would direct you to attachment D in your agenda packet this evening for the second uh, for this uh, this item uh, relating to delayed projects or project phases that were rescheduled that were scheduled to receive uh, funding in fiscal year 2018 of the current TIP. Um, our transportation improvement program policy uh, requires that at the end of every federal fiscal year, September 30th uh, of the year, uh, we review the status of projects that were programmed to receive funding through the TIP uh, in that program year uh, to get their status and projects that have not initiated uh, the project or that phase that was programmed in that fiscal year um, are considered first year delayed um, and we consult with the project sponsors for those projects per the TIP policy, uh, identify sort of the, the main driving factors that led to that project not being able to proceed within that program year and develop with the project sponsor staff a plan of action to get that project back on track and get those funds obligated as soon as possible after the beginning of the next fiscal year. Um, it's important because when we program these funds in the Transportation Improvement Program uh, and a project doesn't proceed, it is basically tying up money in the TIP that could have been available to another project that might have been more ready to go. So we take this pretty seriously. Um, 
This year, there are 23 projects in the TIP that represents about a third of the projects or phases that were programmed in federal fiscal year 2018 that didn't meet their milestone to be considered to initiate. Um, we've worked with all of the project sponsors for all of those 23 uh, projects. Uh, to date, at, at least three of them have already now proceeded and initiated their projects, so they're actually no longer considered delayed, but at the time that this was done and sort of our milestone of, of September 30th, they had not been initiated, so they were officially delayed. Um, there are a variety of reasons. I think, you know, as many reasons as there are projects, um, uh, but many of them relate to um, uh, some staffing turnover or changes at a project's a agency, at an a a sponsor's agency uh, that held up sort of progressing with the project. Uh, there were, can be holdups in contracting with a consultant to perform design services. There can be right-of-way clearance issues. Um, there are, have been issues just uh, entering into the project agreement that's required between the sponsoring agency and CDOT um, and the factors that contribute to those delays uh, in entering those project agreements can begin with the project sponsor or they can be delays on the CDOT end. And we're, uh, our interest is getting to a plan of action to actually move those projects forward. Uh, we've developed that action plan. Your report is attached in your agenda packet. Uh, this evening, we're seeking a motion from the board to recommend the actions proposed by Dr. Cox staff regarding the TIP project delays for fiscal year 2018. Um, just one last um, item, Mr. Chair. We'll remind the board that these first year delays are different than the second year delays that you all uh, considered back in October. October, I believe, at the October meeting. Uh, we had two projects, the 16th Street Mall project uh, and a project in Commerce City for 72nd Avenue and Colorado Station sidewalk projects. Both of those were second year delays. The board granted them 120 day extensions to get those projects uh, moving forward. Um, last Friday, Commerce City put to add their project, so that project is no longer second year delayed. They've met their milestone, and we understand from um, RTD in Denver that the 163 mall project will also be able to meet uh, its commitment to get that project advertised for their contractor to move that project forward as well. Ms. Ron talked about this. The uh, two-year delay projects were of most interest at the RTC uh, yesterday morning. Uh, we've spoke with Mr. Teeter, who's a representative of Commerce City, and you just heard Ron's update on that one. It looks like that one's okay. Mr. Van Meter very vigorously informed us that that project will make the January 29th. But uh, as we continue to remind everyone at this two-year time that unless there is something significant and reason, you do face the chance of losing your federal funds on these dollars and they get returned to the rest of the group. So it moves you to make sure that as a representative of any of these projects, and especially the ones, and myself included, in the first year that you don't become on the list the second year um, because you do end up losing that. A part of what we discussed uh, yesterday morning uh, with Shoshana is that we plan to sit down uh, with Doug Rex, myself, and some of her and her staff, and to look at the processes that we're using that we see that are repetitive, that are potential delays through CDOT to see if there's some process improvement that we can work on. Uh, Shoshana was very <coughs> open to doing that, and we're going to schedule that as soon as she has a moment to breathe. Before she gets too big of a breath, we want to make sure we get our part done first. But uh, I think working together as a group, we can start to resolve some of these process issues and see if there's not a way to streamline them so that they're not the same process every time that keeps holding them up and putting these projects from a one-year delay into a two-year delay. So we're going to continue to work that as representatives from Dr. Cog and our other agencies, whether it's RTD, CDOT, EPA, whoever. We're trying to find ways to get you off the first-year delays if it's nothing more than process and paperwork. Mr. Teeter. Voices? There you go. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Just a little, give you a little bit update. We, d we did go through three different public works of directors this last year. Maria D'Angelo went to Littleton, I believe, and then um, Mrs. Halstead ran it for a while. She has now went to Arapahoe County, and we have hired a new person called, um, with his name is Joe Wilson, and I did speak to him as early as Monday night on the same subject, and he told me, 
we are moving forward. <laughs> so all you guys who are stealing public works directors, leave them alone. <laughs> At this point, Mr. Pfeiffer. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, can we also just add some clarity and, re and remind the rest of the board that this process, the lay reports process, will oh, is only during this tip process, and that it does change that we voted on. And maybe you can add some clarity for some of the board members of what improvements uh, we would see in the future with this delay process. Because I mean, obviously, when I saw this, I thought that there was a process problem to see that many. Anecdotally, I thought this was high, but I was reminded that this is common. But I think there's an opportunity to improve the process if we see this many. But do we have the pleasure of the chair to have staff just kind of remind us, uh, Francis? One would like to address it. Yes, uh, to... Mr. Chair, Director Pfeiffer. Uh, yes, indeed. I mean, we we. I, when this board adopted the TIP policy for the next TIP, we had a, a pretty uh, robust conversation about uh, project delays and the process, especially because of the sort of change uh, this TIP cycle and sort of some structural changes uh, for the for the upcoming TIP. And uh, we committed to you that we're gonna we're gonna continue to work with our project sponsors and our partner agencies to identify those opportunities to um, get ahead of those issues and head off as many. Uh, project delays as we possibly can. Uh, one of those components relates to identifying projects that are in potential delay earlier than the end of the fiscal year in which the projects are programmed. Uh, secondly, we've been working with CDOT staff and they've been very accommodating and helpful in terms of identifying some of the precursor work that a project sponsor needs to do at the beginning of, of a project to develop the project agreement for a project so that the project sponsors know what information they need to provide, some of the paperwork and, and forms and information that's required to, uh, to be provided to CIOT in order to develop that project agreement. We're getting that information out earlier uh, and encouraging project sponsors to start that process with CDOT uh, well early in the program year and not waiting till six months into the program year to even begin uh, that process because that just puts everyone in a bind and kind of slows down the entire process. And in fact, um, because the board, ha board and RTC have now adopted into the draft tip the regional share projects, those eight projects, uh, we're going to be working with those project sponsors uh, as we get a better handle on when they will be programmed within the four-year tip period to begin that process now even before the tip is adopted uh, later on this year so that they can get a head start on uh, some of that effort and, and have those projects ready to go. So we're pursuing a lot of different avenues to try to avoid um, some of these uh, issues. Any other comments or questions on this item before we move? Motion is recommended tonight is to recommend actions proposed by the Dr. Cox staff regarding the TIP project delays for fiscal year 2018. Do I have a motion? I have a so moved and I'm not sure who did it. Okay. Second? Have? All those in favor of the motion as presented signify with aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion is carried. Ms. Lindsay, come join us, please. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Emily Lindsay. I'm a transportation planner here at Dr. Cog. And I'm joined by Jessica Fields from Tool Design, and we're really excited to talk to you all about the Active Transportation Plan. Um, before I dig in, I really just want to say thank you to you, to your staff, and your residents for participating in this planning process. Um, for over a year, we really couldn't have done it without the partnerships and collaboration, so thank you all. Just as a quick reminder, I'm going to go through the schedule just to remind everybody about where we've been and how we got here. This project kicked off. Uh, late 2017, and we spent the early part of 2018 gathering data, doing um, information analysis, and we did the existing conditions part of that project. Um, through June of 2018, when we really started the local government outreach and public outreach element of the plan, throughout the summer we worked with our stakeholders to develop draft networks, and throughout late summer and early fall we did additional outreach um, as we developed the draft plan and refined the network. 
in late 2018 um, through, through now. We worked with stakeholders throughout a public comment period um, to review the plan and update the plan based on the comments that we received before we brought it through this plan approval process. And just as a quick reminder, we really, as part of this process, um, wanted to adhere to Metro Vision's goals and really focus on all ages, all abilities, incomes. Um, so we're really planning for the folks that are interested but concerned when it comes to bicycling. Um, we conducted a resident survey across the region and found pretty similar results to the national um, averages. And again, six out of 10 folks are interested but concerned. So at the forefront of our planning process was really this idea that we wanted to develop a safe, comfortable, and connected active transportation network. And that's kind of the theme that we follow through this planning process. Now I'm going to hand it over to Jessica to talk a little bit more about the details. Thank you. So uh, as you can see here, uh, we followed uh, generally a three-part planning process to develop this active transportation plan. Uh, and Emily uh, went through uh, some of these when she talked through the schedule, um, but I will I won't spend a lot of time on this slide because the next several slides we're going to dig into some highlights uh, in terms of each of these components uh, of the plan and the planning process itself. So first of all, engagement, uh, you know, and this, this really took a couple different forms. It was stakeholder engagement and it was general public engagement. This was so critical for us, uh, for our team to understand uh, particularly what member governments wanted out of this planning effort. You know, a regional bicycle and pedestrian plan um, it can be an abstract thing because it's so high level, right? So it was really important for us to really start the process asking the right questions, talking to stakeholders, and seeing uh, where people were with their planning processes locally and what they wanted to see in terms of how it all connected. Uh, so we did a lot of outreach, a lot of meetings and workshops with stakeholders, uh, with an active transportation stakeholder committee, which included uh, member, uh, representative member agencies from across the region, but not every single agency because there are so many. Uh, so we had a smaller group that worked more intensively and regularly. Uh, but then uh, we had stakeholder workshops. We had five of these where we engaged uh, 55 participants. And this uh, involved people from every member jurisdiction. Every member government was were invited to these. So we were able to have smaller scale conversations. And this is where we really started to develop our regional map and what the vision should be. Uh, we also were out in full force on Bike to Work Day. This is one of the ways we engage the general public. Uh, we thought it was really great to take advantage of such a successful event that Dr. Cog holds, uh, where all types of bicyclists or potential bicyclists come. So we asked a lot of questions and, and did surveys at that, at that event. Um, and then finally, we did online surveys. Um, one part of that was a statistically valid survey. Um, and this was important for us to be able to hear not only from you know, sort of the typical people that we might hear from during a planning process, and particularly during a bicycle and pedestrian one, but we wanted to hear from everybody. So uh, this reached a pretty representative group, a uh, male, male survey. Uh, male, meaning post office male, sorry, uh, uh, male, uh, mailed to people um, reaching a representative group demographically of the region. So we got to hear from people, um, you know, who are underrepresented typically, and this was really important to us. So uh, Emily mentioned uh, we, we did quite a bit of analysis uh, and research as we started out the planning process. Uh, we not only looked at what was happening within the Denver region, but we looked at what was happening in terms of best practices around the country, at some peer MPOs, um, and so that gave us some ideas uh, for recommendations. Uh, and now, the, la the next few slides, I'll talk about um, some more physically or geographically oriented things that you'll see in the plan. Uh, so one of the chapters uh, is devoted to this. And the first thing, uh, we identify pedestrian focus areas. Uh, and these are areas that either have a high amount of pedestrian activity today or are anticipated to have a high amount of pedestrian activity based on land uses, um, based on destinations, and, and even based on things like um, a, a crash history with pedestrians and vehicles. So these are the areas that the plan identifies as